Hello, everyone. It's the Grouchy Historian back here to begin the second quarter of our American Constitution course. All right, so let's begin. Now we're going to get into sort of the nuts and bolts and mechanics of how their constitution was formed, ratified, and what's really in the Constitution. That's right, because I'm willing to bet that very, very few Americans, although we endlessly debate and argue about it, have actually read the entire Constitution. But guess what? You're going to. Okay, here we go. So let's go to the first week. All right, how do we get a constitution, right? When we last left the colonies, they were still fighting a war with the English to uh, win their independence, but now they are an independent country. The Treaty of Paris in 1783 has given them independence from Britain. And the last British, um, the last British troops finally, finally leave eh, somewhere later that fall and everything is all hunky-dory, right? new. Now we sort of see the structural challenges with the Articles of Confederation really come out, uh, really come up to the fore because now you don't have sort of that wartime pressure of, as Benjamin Franklin famously said, we must all hang together or we shall surely hang separately. Now you start to see the states begin to uh, assert themselves, right? As it says here, after the war, the new United States were anything but. They were not United States in the sense that they are today, right? The states, of course, if you remember how the Articles of Confederation were set up, the states still jealously guarded their power. And consequently, there were numerous issues with trade, foreign policy, and as always, most important, wartime debt, because most everything in government has to do with the Benjamins, right? So this debt that both the, the collective Continental Congress and each of the states had accumulated from the war were keeping the country from enjoying the fruits of their sacrifice, right? More importantly, and this is the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize as an impetus to um, redo the Articles of Confederation, we'll talk more about that in a minute, was there were a number of rebellions over taxes and debts, most famously Shays' Rebellion in the, in the state, now state of Massachusetts, that generally scared the tar out of the um, state governments and the still existing Continental Congress. There was a genuine feeling that, that the, the United States were coming apart at the seams. And they were not far wrong. We, the states, again, because they were jealously guarding their own rights and privileges, were launching virtual trade wars with each other, almost establishing their own foreign policy. It was a hot mess. So enter the dynamic duo of Alexander Hamilton and, Thomas, and James Madison. They had a covert action plan. And I don't, I use that word very specifically. They had a covert action plan. They decided to get a meeting of the minds, right? All of the great colonial uh, players, uh, power players at the time, the men who had sat in the Continental Congress, Congresses, who had, run, who had been in state legislature, you know, men of, of experience, both in war, government, to get together in Philadelphia and fix, fix the Articles of Confederation. Of course, this is not what happened. As soon as they got there, they basically said, yeah, eh, this isn't going to work. They tossed it out and started all over. Now, a couple of interesting points as you read the essays for this week. And of course, if you had you know, bothered to buy this wonderful, awesome book, uh, which I'm trying to do in my little thing here, The Words That Made Us, um, there's some interesting new uh, scholarship here from Professor Amar that says that, uh, which I find I found pretty compelling. Number one, the key person to the Constitutional Convention was in fact neither Alexander Hamilton nor James Madison. It was George Washington, right? George Washington, indispensable man, father of our country, victor of Yorktown, all around great guy and what the one person that could truly unite Americans. His participation in this was key. Now Washington was on board. He also had his doubts about how well the Articles of Confederation weren't and were not working. But he also had, as Professor Amar argues, some very definite viewpoints of what he wanted a new constitution to accomplish. And there's an interesting analysis in the book about who actually had 
the greatest effect on what eventually became the Constitution, whether it's Hamilton, whether it's Madison, whether it's Washington. And he makes an interesting point that Washington had a really outsized influence that I don't think most Americans think about because Washington didn't say much, right? If you look at the reading, the uh, writings from the convention, most of which come from Madison, there was lots of debate. Everybody talked, dare I say, bloviated, uh, pontificated, enumerated, blah, 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 blah. Washington did not. Washington was not a speech maker. He was a man of action. And more importantly, Washington just sort of sat there and was Washington, right? He didn't have to say much. He was George. He was the man. He just sat there. But he worked a lot behind the scenes to make sure that he got what he wanted. So here's a little interesting tidbit. So Washington and, and Hamilton were extremely concerned with what they saw as the total lack of accountability and um, foresight to basically help the nation wage war as soldiers, right? Washington had been commander of the Continental Army. Alexander Hamilton had been pretty much his aide de camp, right hand man, chief of staff, all around dude. They were very concerned that the government, the new government of the United States, have the ability to wage war, raise armies, raise taxes, fund a navy, if the time came to defend the United States again. This is not something that I think we think about a lot. I certainly did not. But Professor Amar makes a very strong case in his book that that was Washington's covert goal. I mean, he wanted all the other things that we'll talk about here in a second, too. But his number one plan was he never wanted a situation that happened to the Continental Army to happen again. Now, once they got together, of course, they all decided, yeah, the Articles of Confederation weren't, uh, weren't workable. And then, of course, the down and dirty, practical, messy job of politics began. As we see here, there was a lot of issues to resolve. The biggest ones, of course, were the Big states versus the small states, unicameral legislature, bicameral legislature, whether the representative, you know, how do we pick senators? How do we pick House, pick representative? All of these debates were gone through, right? Until you emerged with what we now know as the Great Compromise, where you had a Senate where each state had equal representation and a House of representa uh, Representatives where you had proportional representation based on the number of citizens of the state. We're gonna talk about that some more uh, next week. But they also, of course, because it's government, and what does government wanna talk about? The money, taxation, the power to regulate commerce and Im impose import duties, the balance of federal and versus states' rights. This would become a huge point of contention when they put out the new uh, constitution for ratification by the states. If you look at the theme of a number of the anti-federalist papers, which we will see in the next couple of weeks were written in response to the federalist papers, which we'll see in the next couple of weeks were trying to, to market as it were, sell the constitution to the new country. You'll see that that was a very, very important topic because again, the states were very reluctant to give up their some of their rights. So there was a constant balance of what specific powers, responsibilities do we give to a federal government? Which ones are retained by the states? How do, you know, what are the rights of the states to do certain things versus what things should only the, the federal government do, such as coin, mint money, exercise foreign policy, declare war, we're going to go over all these in the next couple of weeks. And of course, liberty. We see from almost the very beginning of the uh, conversation about the Constitution that there was a, a concern that the Constitution, as it was originally signed, did not go far enough to guarantee the individual liberties, individual rights, that of course, all of the, the uh, new American citizens said, hey, we just fought a war for all these, and we're not feeling the love here that you've got these properly protected. So all of these issues came up as they went through the, uh, the actual drafting, arguing, voting, rewriting, all the things to get the Constitution. Now, if you read some of these essays for this week, you'll see that, yes, at the end of the day, they felt that while they, and, and I think you'll see this theme go through here, while they didn't have a perfect form of government, because again, our founders were, were very well-educated men and studied government philosophy, etc. There was no such thing. They were pretty clear, right? They picked government 
a, a form of government that they felt would best represent their interests, tax them and bother them the least, and do the best at safeguarding and protecting what they felt were their God-given rights and liberties, right? Government was, in a sense, a necessary evil. We have to have it. Therefore, we're going to have as little of it as possible. We're going to make sure that it cannot become tyrannical like that evil dude, King George and Parliament that we just fought a war against. And that is to the greatest extent possible, it's not going to tax us to death as we, again, went to those, you know, war with those dudes from England over taxes on tea and paper and everything else. Okay. So there was always a sense of compromise, minimize and balance the powers that they, they they would soon go ask the citizenry, we'll talk about that in the next couple of weeks too, to give the federal government. So as you read the essays for this week, keep that in mind because there's um, they were pretty clear headed about it. I mean, they were optimistic. They certainly thought that this was the best form of government possible, but they also recognized that, that it was going to take work. Right, it was going to. There was still a lot of practical things to work out that they had to 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 uh, work their way through to get a functioning, realistic government that actually served the needs of the people. Okay, so that's this week. That's sort of the the convention and where you get it. And now we're going to uh, look at the um, uh, next week. We're going to actually read the first part of the Constitution and start actually picking apart what the Constitution actually says. Okay, we'll see you then.